All right, so let's take a look at the combustion air side of things. So early on in the, the first of the lecture series, I had described to you that how venting and ventilation kind of were kind of one and the same and um, venting, we kind of consider it as getting rid of um, the gases and things, but the combustion air side, the supply of that has to also be part of this. So we're gonna take a look at at that in our application to uh, see what those rules are. So um, if you are doing it as you go along in here, uh, for my students, um, there is a questionnaire if you happen to have that, uh, the um, number 67 on the combustion air questions. You can do that as you go right along. All right, so the first one that I want to address or deal with is an application where we're gonna take a look at a 100,000 B2 natural draft furnace. And uh, I'm expecting with dilution air, combustion air, to have roughly about 37 and a half cubic feet of air. And obviously uh, that, that, that assumption is actually based upon having about 50% excess air plus the dilution air, and there's a considerable amount. So when we take a look at at that, you know, 100, uh, if we take a look at 100,000 BTU furnace, that deals with 100 cubic feet per hour of gas. The air for the combustion is gonna end up being about 1,500 cubic feet per hour. The dilution air will be at about 1,400 cubic feet an hour. And then of course, the total air combined is 2,900 cubic feet per hour. Now, if you divide that over 60 minutes in an hour, that means you got 48, CFM of air that has to be made up. Um, that's a lot. 2,900 cubic feet of air an hour out of a structure um, if you're running that unit. So that's essentially going to be the Kamzintas. So how we get that air? Well, we got a couple different options. So one of them is relying on infiltration. And infiltration is essentially the air that leaks into a structure by leaks, by holes, by um, even though as tight as you think you got a building, there's still some air that leaks into a building. Now, the tighter the building, the harder this is. Um, so if you've got, uh, let's say, an older home, you probably have a lot more leakage. If you got a newer home, um, it's probably quite tight. In fact, some of the new homes may even be tighter than what's even identified down on the bottom here. Um, an average home, they're identifying as, you know, six tenths to one air change per hour. Um, the minimum, there's a minimum amount of air that, that is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to leak into a building or allow it to uh, make up all, or replenish all this makeup air in, um, by code. And typically you have to start concerning yourself when your buildings are less than, let's say 0.35 air changes per hour within a structure. So uh, estimated infiltration rate. So I wanna look at, an, at an, a house here and we'll take a look at a loose old house and what is going to be with this. So I'm, we guesstimated about a one air change per hour. The volume of this structure uh, between everything above grade is roughly about 20,000 cubic feet. Infiltration at one air changes per hour mean you're leaking 20,000 cubic feet of air per hour. So this one seems like an awful lot of air that's leaking into this building. Um, for 100,000 B2s per B2 furnace, the combustion air that I would potentially need would maybe be close to 1500, 1,500 cubic feet of air per hour that would need to leak into there. So as you can see, we're, if you look at this number, you look at this number, we got a lot of air that's leaking into this structure. We don't really need to worry about, about the air for right now. Um, so that, for that reason, that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of your older homes, you don't even have an issue with air you know with with uh, with combustion air is typically their infiltration rates are plenty high so not not overly concerned about that so let's take a look at 
some contaminated air. And because um, that is an issue. So we could run into a problem where the quality of the combustion air may not be very good. You could have a problem where maybe you're dealing, you've got air contaminants such as like uh, chlorinated uh, bleaches, or you could have some paint thinners. Um, and it's not like you're leaving cans lay around, but they may be um, either off-gassing through holes um, with, within some of these containers, or um, you could have even salt blocks laying around, and that, would, that can do that. Dryer sheets, there's a number of things that would relate to that. Even a refrigerant leak will do it. There's very numerous things that can cause um, some issues with, with uh, combustion, and you could have a, uh, it could actually create a deteriorated vent system just because of the burning of these things because of the acids that they create. So let's take a look at the next application, which is essentially a or an unconfined space. So. What I want to deal with, the first thing I want to do is throw out here is, in your code book, they're going to talk a little bit about what is considered a confined space and an unconfined space. And the confined space in the terms of combustion air pertains to, you need a space, you need a volume in that space that's above grade that is greater than 50 cubic feet of volume per thousand BTUs of appliance that would be put in here. Now this is assuming an appliance that's using combustion air from within the building. Now there are applications where um, if a, let's say for example, an appliance has a direct um, bit of air that's going directly to that appliance. So maybe it's a sealed combustion appliance or maybe it's an appliance that's uh, a direct vent appliance that is has a feed of supply air that's used for combustion going directly to that appliance, then those types of appliance can be disregarded. But appliances that are not direct vent, you need to make sure that you're um, that you are considering them. So that's clearly any any system that does not have its own makeup air going to that unit, you need to make sure that you're identifying is it confined or not confined. And, and there, are some, there are several rules that pertain to that. So in this particular case, um, we have 140,000 B2s total. Um, the, you know, if I, the, the rule is 50 cubic feet per 1,000 B2s per hour. So if I take the 140,000 B2s per hour divided by 100 or divided by 1,000, that means I have 140. 140 thousands of BTUs times the 50 cubic feet that I need per thousand BTUs gives us 7,000 cubic feet of air. Is a, cubic feet of air is the absolute minimum amount that I need. Um, under that, it would be considered as a confined space. Over that, it would not be confined, and I would not be required to uh, supply uh, adequate makeup air or makeup air in this case, because we would assume that we can leak it into the building. Now, that doesn't, mean, doesn't guarantee that, but it actually is kind of one of the ways that we'll, we'll look at it. It's a starting point. So what is the space volume in this space? So if I take a 24 foot by eight foot by 38 foot deep structure, I've got 7,296 cubic feet of air. That is over, uh, so, so really, I've got 70, almost 7,300 cubic feet of air that's made. It is definitely not a confined space. So that's, uh, in this application, I would see no problems with just using this and relying on infiltration air, provided that it functions correctly. There are other applications, uh, like on the previous example, that if, let's say, for example, you have a, a customer that's got a, a lot of exhaust air that for whatever they're, they might be doing, um, that could create some, some issues for you. So again, there's no guarantee, but it's a starting point. Um, so moving on. So what about um, in this particular case? So let's say in the previous one, the construction was uh, kind of, a, kind of an, a normal average, you know, typical leaking, leaky space. So let's, what if we have very tight construction, as in a lot of the new a lot of your new construction nowadays, the construction's fairly, fairly tight. They seal things up pretty well. So we, um, we may not have enough. 
So let's take a look at this example. So this one, I happen to have a building that's 24 feet by eight feet and it's 38 feet deep. So if we are concerned that, hey, is it confined or is it not confined? Um, I want to take a look at some of those, at some, whoops, I want to take a look at this. So the rules um, for this particular one here, um, I'll have to look at some of those rules on there. So let's take a look at uh, in a little deeper and then I'll come back to this one a little bit, um, this example. So for an unconfined space to a tight building, some of the rules for those applications are such, is that if it's too tight of a building and, you, and you're in a, uh, and you can't really, you don't feel like it's supplying you enough air, what do I do? So the rule is that you can provide two air openings each one of those is size one square inch per 4,000 BTUs. And one of the openings would be up high, one of the openings would be down low. So I'm gonna go back to that image here. And so they're showing you one opening high near the ceiling and one opening near the floor. Now they're showing in this, in this application a, a building that is, um, that the vents are in the exterior walls. Now this could be you know, that, 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 that's sometimes what you have to do. In certain applications and certain, certain jobs, you may end up having to do that. Uh, certainly down south, they would do those types of things in, let's say, a garage or something like that where um, that area could potentially be, uh, you know, it might be unconfined, but they want to make sure they also have uh, su sufficient uh, ventilation and makeup air. So... The other, th the other rule is that the openings cannot be smaller than 100 square inches. So, there are, so some of those rules would be like no, no dimension can be less than three inches high. Um, it's gotta be more than that. Um, you know, must be permanent openings. That means you can't put a, ma a manual damper that somebody could close. So those are some of those rules. Um, if it's ducted to the outdoors, you know, does the ratio change? Yes, the ratio changes it gets cut in half. So now you need double the amount of square inches. So it's one square inch per 2,000 BTUs. And then the size of the louvers in that situation, um, if assuming that it's like the picture was shown where we're looking at um, one of the openings near the ceiling, one opening is near the floor. So 140,000 divided by 4,000 means I need 35 square inches per opening. So, and that's a free area. So in this case, the minimum states 100 square inches, no, nothing less than that. So when you think about it, uh, uh, a typical, you know, a 10 inch by 10 inch, it's all free, free air would be, you'd have 100 square inches. So we're not talking huge openings in, in most cases. So, you know, and if they're ducted, then it's 140,000 um, divided by the 2,000 B2s you know, that you would need to have for the ratio of one per two and that's essentially 70 square inches. Again, shouldn't be an, a, big, a big deal. In the code book, they do describe this process at 9.3.1, and it's two permanent openings method is how they define that. So again, you know, just because, just because you've got, it's an, you, you figured it if that's an unconfined space, if for some reason the, the building is just tighter than you thought, or that air is being exited out of the building faster, you, you may need to, to uh, put in some sort of an air intake uh, to allow you to, to do that. So if I look further at this example, now I wanted to show you what about these louvers and exactly how this should this, how this, should this look. So I, I described it earlier that I said the key thing is we have to look at free area. And in this particular case, if I happen to have a, a wall or a building where near the furnace and I need to make this area larger to make sure that I have sufficient air to, to, be, to make this air up, um, there is, there's a process that you have to go through on this thing. So they wanna make sure that, you, that they are um, considering the blocking effect of those veins. So again, that's why I emphasized about the free area. So in the examples that I'm showing you over on, this, on the left side here, I'm talking about free area, okay? A wood louver, what they are figuring is if you had a 10 by 12 inch louver and they're using a factor of 25%, that's what they're assuming is 75% of the louver is actually covered up by wood and other 
method. So you really only have, even though you feel like I have 120 square inches, it's only 30 square inches ends up being the amount of free area. So I usually look for, um, on my louvers, I will look for the free area, which will typically be an AK factor of the vent. And that would be an area, that would be the free area in square feet, um, typically is the way that I do that. So then you'd have to convert it, obviously, to if it's square inches and that you're looking for. That's easy enough to do since there's 144 square inches in a, in a square foot. Um, if it were a metal louver, okay, that's most of the louvers that most people are going to probably use are a metal louver. Now there you can see that it's only a 25% reduction so for the louvers. So that means, um, and, and this is purely an estimate. Um, you, in all cases, I would use the manufacturer's recommendations and look at their AK factor. So in this case, that 10 by 12 louver with a 75% uh, ratio means that now I've got 90 square inches. There again, you got to have, uh, what you have to have is you have to make sure that you have at no less than 100 square inches of free area is what is what would be typically needed. So again, just don't forget about that. So I've talked about unconfined spaces, but what about confined spaces? So in this case here with unconfined spaces, I've got, or a confined space, I've got a gas appliance located in this space. And usually this is something that a, a technician will kind of spot when you walk into a building and you go into the mechanical room and you notice that, holy cow, you know, the mechanical room is really small. You know, what, what's going on here? And, and you know, is this a confined space? Because you might, especially if you're there for some issues that could be potentially related to venting issues. So, the def again, the, the, def the definition here is that the, a confined space is having a volume that's less than 50 cubic feet per thousand BTUs per hour. So, in this particular case, I've got 140,000 BTUs of total appliance BTUs. Divide that by your thousand and that's coming out to 140. So 140 times the 50 cubic feet per thousand tells you me I need to have 7,000 cubic feet of air minimum. Now that 7,000 cubic feet of air minimum, the next thing I gotta do is look at what my volume in the space is. So in this case, a 10 inch, or a 10 foot by eight foot by 38 foot building, or room area, not building, but room, is has only 3,040 cubic feet. And this would clearly tell me that this is definitely a confined space and it could lead to some problems with the furnace not venting right, not burning correctly. It could lead to some other issues with uh, even pulling gases from one furnace or one appliance out and being used as the combustion air for another appliance. So this is a, a legitimate issue and it's a legitimate problem. I've even seen furnaces that have had the, the uh, limits, the block vent limits fail or an open up and some of the other types of limits open up with this. So definitely have to look at this. So what do we do in those situations? So clearly we had a confined space and now what? So there is a, the preferred method so that you're not bringing in all this air from outside and bringing it into the building. It, it would be the equivalent of you just opening up a, a window in your house. Um, they want to avoid that if at all possible. So the first choice is let's see if we can use the air from inside the building. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to combine that mechanical room with an adjacent room is what we want to try to do. So that means what if I were to take this room and this room and add them together. So when we look at this, and this is definitely the preferred method, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little calculation to figure that out. So, um, so what do we do in this case? So, oops, let me back up a step here. So if I were to take that area, and instead of it being 10, um, it now ends up being 24 so if I take the 24 feet by 8 feet by 38 that would definitely um, put us into a, an unconfined situation it would be totally good so now what about the opening so the openings have to be a square inch per thousand b2s per hour for every opening so let's let's proceed 
So when we want to use air from those adjacent, adjacent rooms, and we've got a rule of a one square inch per thousand, since that air around that is, um, you know, we'll draw that air, two openings, one each. So the rules are this. You got to have one of those openings within 12 inches of the ceiling. One of them has to be within 12 inches of the floor. They, essentially what they try to do is they try to figure, well, one of them is, you know, going to be within the 12 inches of the ceiling is like a ventilation one. I think the bottom line is I think they create two openings primarily so that you, if one of those were to become blocked, you still have another one as kind of a backup plan on there. And that's, those have been the rule, that has been the rules for a long time. The openings can't be smaller than 100 square inches of free area. So must be permanent openings and no dampers. So what are the, what size louvers are required for a 100,000 BTU furnace? So the 100,000 divided by 1,000, 100 square inches, it's also the minimum as well. You need to just make sure you have that. So let's look at the next one. So in this, this one here, you might notice how this one's slightly different in the fact that uh, we are using horizontal ducts. So in, you might have a, an application where they are pulling air from outside, bringing it into a, into a room that is confined, and they're gonna run a horizontal duct. In fact, two horizontal ducts. Every one of those openings for that duct would have to have be one square inch per 2,000 B2s per hour for each opening with this uh, type of an application. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So what are those rules? So two openings, one square inch per 2,000, you got to put one within 12 inches of the ceiling and one within 12 inches of the floor. Can't be smaller than 100 square inches and no dampers. They got to be permanent openings. So those are um, that, those are some of the rules for horizontal ducts in these cases. So what if we want to pull air from a vented attic or a ventilated attic? So they have rules for that. Um, so the, the expectation is that there are louvers in the attic that allow you to draw air in directly from that attic, on each end of the attic, specifically. And uh, however that happens to be, that you have to make sure you can provide a sufficient amount of ventilation into the attic. Now, in this example, they're showing two openings. They're showing one opening that's going to be, they're using uh, ventilation directly communicating with the attic um, for an opening, and that's ventilation air, and that's one square inch per 4,000, and then the duct, they want it to extend uh, a foot off of the off, off of the floor, and um, that's uh, been a typical rule for for quite a few years since they've been doing this in the code book. But so those are some of those. So let's recap some of those rules. If you're going to pull air out of an attic or a crawl space, even for that matter, um, the rules apply. Two openings, one of them, each one in size at a thousand or one square inch per four thousand. One opening is within twelve inches of the ceiling one opening is with within 12 inches of the floor the openings cannot be smaller than 100 square inches and they cannot be dampered they have to be permanent openings so let's look at this application so this one you can see how we're taking ventilation air from or ventilation air is in from the attic and we're taking um, combustion air, ventilation air from an, from let's call it a louvered or an unheated crawl space, which is typically what you would normally run into here. So in this case, we're pulling the air from, from uh, you know, we can pull the air from this vent, make its way up into the mechanical room, and this one's kind of my backup to some extent, we'll call it. So if I were to recap those two applications, they're, they're basically the same with the exception of the vent. On um, this one, you might have noticed we had to be within a foot of the floor or a foot off the floor. And in this case, we've got an opening that's, that's uh, each opening is a square inch per 4,000 BTUs, one opening within 12 inches of the ceiling, one of the floor, not less than 100 square inches. And you can't have a damper in there to, damp to damper that off. So. All right, so in a nutshell, 
let's summary, summarize some of these rules for combustion air for buildings based on the code, uh, the National Fuel Gas Code. So the first one is confined space is defined as any volume of space that's less than 50 cubic feet of air per 1,000 BTUs per hour. The second one is the combustion air. When you're taking combustion air from outside, you can use two louvers, one square inch per 4,000, and if it's horizontal ducts, it's gonna be a square inch per 2,000 BTUs. All air from inside, let's say a loose home and also a room that is sufficient, you can get away with two louvers, one square inch per 1,000 BTUs per hour um, will work. For a crawl space in the attic, two openings, you gotta have one high, you gotta have one low, um, and all the openings size a square inch per 4,000 BTUs per hour. All openings have to have a minimum square inch of minimum of 100 square inches, and um, that is usually will suffice for that. This is probably the probably the most confusing part of the a lot of the code issues on here because the of generally the way they spread it around the code book. So hopefully this will help uh, to some extent clarify some of these things. Um, you. Um, I would suggest looking at the handout on the code guide um, for combustion air where I separate them out even more and uh, give you some more details on there. So that's the handout 35 for um, the combustion air, um, that's a code guide. Um, make sure you complete the 